2 Samuel chapter number 5 and verse 1. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David and to Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said, thee, said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. He was thirty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years. Bless this book now tonight, Lord, in thy name I pray, amen. If you'll remember your Bible study, Hebron is where they went in when they left Kadesh Barnea after they'd wandered in the wilderness, and they brought back a cluster of grapes, took two men to carry it, and they said there were giants in the land. And Hebron is where they came and went from. So obviously there were giants at Hebron. And it's noticeable how that, uh, that uh, God started with David here. This is the beginning of his kingship. Forty years he first ruled over the tribes of Judah, and then he ruled over all of the twelve tribes of Israel. He ruled longer. Forty years is a time of testing. And so therefore David established himself as the one king of Israel that could unite the ten northern tribes with the two southern tribes. He did it. And David is a type of Christ in a lot of different ways. One of them we're going to talk about tonight. David was the only king in the Old Testament that could be considered a prophet, a priest, and a king. David was all three. He ate the holy bread in the table of showbread that uh, Uzziah uh, was smitten with leprosy for. So uh, he had access to God that was privileged access. God said of David, a man after mine own heart. But if you look at Second Samuel chapter number 4, and verse number, Second uh, Samuel chapter number 4 and verse 4, it's how the scripture says in Jonathan, Saul's son had a son that was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up, fled, and it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now this is a historical account of a young man, no fault of his own, five years old, who is crippled for the rest of his life. But he's going to have an encounter with David. Now, Mephibosheth lives in what's called Lodibar. The word, if you do the etymology on it, it means no place. Lo in Hebrew means to negate. Lo ami, for example, in the book of Hosea means not my people. Lo ami. Ami is people. Lo means not my people. So Lodibar means no place, not of any place. That's kind of instructive because that's where the unsaved man finds himself. He has no foundation whatsoever, none whatsoever. He drifts as the sea. So are the wicked, the Bible says, drifting is the sea. But Mephibosheth becomes a type of the sinner that needs help because he's stuck in a situation. He can't do anything to change himself. So he's in Lodibar. Now his name <coughs> is very instructive too. For his name is Mephibosheth. Now listen carefully to what that word means. It means one who destroys shame or the end of shame. Now that's quite instructive because when you think that when they named him, they gave him a prophecy in his name. Hebrews like that. If you'll remember when I preached to you this past Sunday morning about the cross, I told you the cross was, also, was an instrument of death, but is also an instrument of life. Many Hebrew words have double meanings, and a lot of times they're, they contrast each other. They have a positive and a negative meaning for the same word. That's very instructive too, because you see the Hebrew is God's language in the Old Testament, and probably, as Bullinger says, the fountainhead of all languages. You can't find where it came from. English came from everywhere. But Hebrew is its own fountainhead, which makes you think that Adam in the garden spoke Hebrew. Hebrew is quite a language, quite an instructive thing. We have a man named Mephibosheth, and he's in Lodibar. He calls attention to that because it's important to understand what these names mean. For example, Bethany. Do you remember what happened at Bethany? Do you remember there at Bethany, right before the crucifixion? Is the house of affliction. Bethlehem 
is the house of bread. Beth Phage is the, is the house of early figs. Beth Shemesh is the house of the sun. Calvary is the place of a skull. The woman mentioned in the book of Judges, her name is Dinah. That means to judge or judgment. And then El Bethel. Well, Bethel is house of God, so El means the God of the house of God. And then Jericho, the moon, mouth, sweet smell. It's what men hold, and in, in, uh, they hold it in, they hold it, it's valuable to them. Jericho, I've been there now six times. No other place on the earth like Jericho. It's below sea level, quite a ways below sea level. And it is an ancient history going back, they say, as far back as humanity, that it's one of the oldest places on earth is Jericho. And then finally there's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of peace. So the city of peace is contrasted with Lodibar. Mephibosheth was in a place where there was no, no place, no name for it, didn't mean anything, and he was lame in his feet. So he needed help, and he needed it badly. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter number uh, uh, 4 and verse 4, But after the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared. Then it says in Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. You see, God is the one who initiates your relationship with him. You feeling a need for the Lord tonight? You didn't create that. That came from God. You're his creature. What is man? Thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, thou visiteth him. When God looks at you, he looks at you differently with eyes that are completely different than he does with an animal. You're not an animal. The world would take you down to the stage of an animal. You're not. You're made in the image of God. That image will, uh, will still be around when he comes back too, by the way. So God loves men. He loves mankind. The mankind, the man, was the crowning achievement of God's creation. He'd already made everything else until he made the man. The man was the last thing God created. He took his body from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils and gave him a soul, and he became a living spirit. He became a spirit being. And this is, of course, from the Almighty. God Almighty loves us, folks. He does. It's hard to understand why, but he does. This is why he chose to come to Mephibosheth. He said, Are there any left of the house of Saul that I might show grace and mercy to them? Why would he say that? It says, uh, it says that they made a league, that David made a league with, Saul, with, uh, with uh, Jonathan, which he loved Jonathan, and Jonathan loved David. He made a league with him that before he died, he would not smite his seed and strike them from the face of the earth. Jonathan says, Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. Well, you know the story of Rizpah. You know the story of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ones who came with molded bread and they lied about, you know, they uh, said they'd come from a foreign country and, uh, and that uh, they had heard about the God of Israel and they were coming because of that. They acted like they didn't know a thing about Jericho. You see, nothing about Jericho. So it was total deception. And uh, Joshua believed them. And so he brought them in. And they were sore in the sight of Israel from that day on. Well, in the time of Jonathan, in the time of Saul, to win the favor of the people, to curry their favor, uh, he had a bunch of them killed. And when he did this, innocent blood was brought upon his hands. God does not like the shedding of innocent blood. These six things doth the Lord hate, seven abomination to him, hands that shed innocent blood. God said to Cain, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth to me from the ground. Blood in the Bible synonymous with life. Life. Life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar for an atonement for the soul. So Saul's, uh, Saul killed off these Ebionites. Uh, he killed them off. And when he did, that brought the judgment of God down upon them. And so a famine came into the land. The famine came into the land because God sent the famine as judgment for what he had done. He'd killed the Gibeonites, and he brought judgment upon him. And so now they cried unto the Lord, and the Lord said, All right, you offer up the sons of Saul, because he's the one guilty of this. And so the Gibeonites were happy with that, offered up the sons of Saul. And so 
Seven sons of Saul were killed during the barley harvest at one time. But God, through David, spared one of Saul's grandsons that the house of Saul would not be completely wiped out from the face of the earth. And that one grandson of Saul, guess who he was? He was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. And why was he spared? Because of his love for David. Because of David's love for Jonathan. Because God had intervened and saw to it the seed of Saul would not perish from the face of the earth. And Mephibosheth was the instrument that God used. Now there's grace here. The Bible said, Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now folks, we can't change that. God does not forgive you because you mean well. He's not going to forgive you because you earn forgiveness. He's not going to forgive you because of the church you go to. He forgives you because of who Christ is. That's a simple fact, but that's a profound truth because I would a lot of people had learned that truth. When you pray to the Father to forgive you, He forgives you based on Christ and what He accomplished at the cross and His relationship with Him. It is not, I'm never worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm never worthy to be forgiven. You see, this is an issue. You're never worthy to, enough to be forgiven. The forgiveness is based entirely upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is, and so God therefore forgives us in Christ. Of course, that's not the only thing the Lord does in Christ. He does everything else in Him. So Mephibosheth is quite a remarkable character because he said when they came to get him and said, the king wants you in his house, Mephibosheth said to himself, I must be, I must be the last one that's called me. I'm finished. I'm gone. But they said, no harm's going to come to you. Brought him to David. And David said, who is left to the house of Jonathan that I might show mercy to him? that I might show grace to him. David was reaching out to show something good to someone who never expected it to happen to them at all. That's what he did in 1973. He reached out and showed something good to someone who never thought he'd ever see anything like that in a day in his life, who wasn't expecting it and who wasn't seeking, searching for it. That's me. I wasn't searching for God, wasn't looking for God. God came to me. And, of course, this is what he did for Mephibosheth. He brought him into the king's house. Mephibosheth was scared to death. He said, who am I? What am I, a dead dog, to come into the house of my lord, the king? I don't deserve to be here. You know, that's a good attitude. The fact of the matter is, that's the kind of attitude that will get you right with God. One of, the biggest instrument, one of the biggest faults I've seen in churches today is spiritual pride. It will eat you alive. Some folks never have anything to get forgiveness for. I don't know how you do it, but i got to come before God <coughs> and bear my soul and get forgiveness. But you see, his attitude was the right attitude. You remember Sunday night, our brother preached about your attitude. I thought that was very good, didn't you? Your attitude has to do with the way you think, the way you see, the way you feel, the way you interpret life, the way you, the way you interpret yourself. What you're going to do in your relationship with God, your attitude. Am I a deserving sinner? Yes. Am I, uh, do I deserve riches? No. Uh, do I deserve honor? No. Honor should go to him. But it's one of these things, remember now, about Hebrew, that if you abase yourself, you will be exalted in the same context with each other. And so this is exactly what Mephibosheth said. He said, I'm a dirty dog, man. I don't deserve to be in here. Well, he didn't call him in there because he deserved it. He didn't call him in there because he was good enough for it. He didn't call him in there in any sense of the word where he could afford it. Because what he did was take the land of Saul and gave it to Mephibosheth. That's right. He took the, the property of Saul and gave it to Mephibosheth. That's quite a thing. Not only did he call him out of Lodibar, he gave him a place. He lived in Jerusalem for the rest of his life. And he gave him the land of his grandfather, Saul. And that's a wonderful thing. But then he let him sit down at the king's table with the king's children in, a, in an honored position. That's grace. That's the goodness and kindness of God toward us. And it's a constant thing that eats at us. And it does all of us. We have this, it, the, well, you know, I have to do something in response. I have to... I have to show God I'm thankful. Well, you will be thankful as the Holy Spirit moves in your heart. But whether you're thankful or not, 
doesn't change what Christ did for you. He didn't bring you into the family of God because you're thankful. He brought you into the family of God because he brought you into the family of God. That's called sovereignty. That's called, that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Why would he come to me and not come to the fellow next to me? I remember the old high school kids watching me when they, after I, they found out I got saved. Now, some of them, I'm sure, said, eh, he won't last long. He'll be done in six months, a year. But I noticed some of them that knew me in high school, I noticed how they were watching me, and they were watching me with an open mind. They were watching me to see, because they knew me beforehand. They knew the one that went to rule high school. They knew me then, and then they heard me say that I'd been saved, and so they watched. You know what? I think a lot of them watched because they wanted something good, and they were hoping that something that it, whatever had happened to me was genuine enough for it to happen to them too. That's a positive attitude. Amen. That's a positive attitude. So Mephibosheth is called in to the table of the king. He sits down at the king's table. He eats the king's food. He enjoys the king's fellowship. He's been blessed with the king. Now, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ here, this is the typology. I sit at the king's table. I've been blessed with the king. I've been honored to sit at the king's table with the king's children. And who am I, a dead dog, that I could come into a place like that I could climb, scratch, and claw for a million years and never earn one second at the king's table. If you ever sit at the king's table, and it's called the marriage supper of the lamb, there's going to be one. If you ever sit at the king's table, it will be because he bidded, bidded, bid, he bid you <laughs> to come, come, come. Do you want to sit at that table tonight? Buddy, I do. And I'm going to tell you something around, ain't nobody going to push me out of my place either. I aim to be there by the grace of God. Yes, I do. Let me show over here the centurion. Here's what he said to Christ. Now, a centurion, I did a little research into the Roman army. A centurion, as you've heard thousands of times, is a Roman officer over a hundred men. Okay, a hundred men, centurion. And if you ever see any photographs of this or a movie or so forth, He'll have a helmet on, and the, uh, and the plumage goes this way instead of back and forth. It goes sideways like a rainbow. That's a centurion. And they say that the centurion had more to do with the battle than, say, the tribune or some general or something. It was the centurion that led the men into battle. He was there. He was in the nuts and bolts of what happened to battle. So here's a man who, you know, he had authority. He was respected. But here's what he said. He said, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. That's what he said. I'm not worthy. Moses, when God called him to go to Pharaoh, here's what Moses said. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Isn't that good? Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a unclean uh, lips of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of Hosts. Woe is me! Comparing themselves with themselves, they're not wise. We're bad for doing that. You look around and you say, "Well, I'm as good as soul. sorry low down dog over there." Yeah, I mean, you probably are. You may be a little better than that sorry low down dog over there. Compare yourself with the perfect Christ, not with each other. You make a grave mistake. Get your eyes off of each other. Quit looking at each other. We're all here tonight, sinners, saved by the grace of God, if you are saved. And we'll be there by grace and grace alone. And grace will keep us until that day, and then grace will present us unto the Father. Daniel chapter number 10, verse 7. I remember the first time I ever read this. It, it made such an impression on me. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. In other words, he just simply lost it all and saw himself as vile and wicked under the light of glory, because he's coming into the presence of glory. And then he said, 
Uh, yet heard I the voice and the words when I heard the voice of his words. Then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, my, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. I know, Daniel, that you see yourself as corruption. I understand. And I realize that there's no strength in you. But listen to the voice of God. Daniel, I love you. I love you. And understand the words that I speak unto thee. And I, stand, I stood upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. You can always tell somebody that has been in the presence of God in one way or another. Prayer room or experience in life. Hospital room or something. You can always tell. Because there's something added to their life that wasn't there before. There is. And there's a little less of them and more of him. And that's what we need. We need less of us and more of him. We need a bunch of John the Baptist in here. You remember John? He's baptized more than you are. He's got more disciples than you are. He said, that's okay. I must decrease, but he must increase. That's John. That's John. Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John. So I stood trembling. Maybe the demons know something we don't. James chapter number 2 and verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. It is no battle with the Lord Jesus Christ now. The battle was finished at Calvary. There is no battle. There is no battle. The Lord Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God seated at the right hand of the Father with all power and all might, all majesty and all glory. He is so much of all of that that you cannot compare him to Satan or any demonic foe or anything. He is infinitely above it all. Infinitely above it. So the devils tremble when they think about him. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, Our God is a consuming fire. What about that? A woman asked me one time, for, when we did a Sunday morning thing on TV, and she sat right there, about the second or third, third row back, and she, she questioned me. And they put it on the television. And she says, Now what do you think about hell? And I said, Let me explain hell to you. I said, Hell is not a flame like you burn a, you burn a piece of wood or something of that nature. Because you're burning, you're burning something that is, that is, that is a, of this earth, you know, something that can burn. I said, hell has flames, and they're the flames like the consuming fire of Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. The flames in hell, friend, are not something to burn up, something physical. The flames in hell are just hotter than any, than any flame that you'll ever see in this world. They're spiritual flames to burn spirits. They're real flames. You know the devil who's bound with a chain, cast into the bottomless pit? Well, that chain is not a physical chain. You can't bind the devil up, but it's a real chain. It's a real chain. And when God binds him, he cannot unbind himself. And when they burn in hell, they scream because they're burning. They're burning. Any man in his right mind would not want to go to hell. And I didn't make hell, and I don't take any pleasure in it. I don't enjoy it. But if you're going to preach the truth of the Bible, the whole truth, you're going to tell people about hell. They've got to hear about it. There is an accounting day coming. We will give an account. We must give an account. And we will. And then finally in Genesis chapter number 32 and verse 20. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. They believe that by seeing God face to face, that they die. But there was somebody in that Old Testament that God said, I'll talk to him face to face. Not, in, not anybody, nobody else but him. He said, I'll talk to him face to face. Who was that? Who did he say he'd talk to face to face? 
His name means draw forth from the Nile River. Moses, Moses, draw forth. I've drawn him forth. Pharaoh's daughter said, I'll call him Moses. God said, I'll talk to him face to face. Plain words, Moses had a relationship with God that not even David had. Nor Samuel, nor Adam, nor any of the rest of them. Noah. Moses was quite a man, folks. When he died, there was a dog fight over his body. And the angel said, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan. You can't have it. And so they buried his body somewhere. I don't know where. Nobody knows where. It's like Cleopatra when she died. The queen of Egypt with Mark Anthony right after the Battle of Actium. She died. But nobody knows where she's buried to this day. Nobody. Nobody. Now, I'll tell you one tomb that they buried somebody in. I've been there at that tomb. They took his body down off the cross, and they laid it in the tomb. Then they rolled a big stone in front of it. And that big stone that they rolled in front of it, they set a guard. And they went back on the third day on a Sunday morning, and the stone was rolled away. And there wasn't anybody in there. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I need your tomb for a little while? <laughs> Just three days. I'm finished with it. <laughs> You'd think they're nuts, wouldn't you? Well, that's all he needed. Joseph of Arimathea did his part. There's a place called Madaba. In, uh, it's, where, it's where it's called the King's Highway. It's in Jordan. And the King's Highway is the way that they came up out of the south and traveled to the north. Well, there's a church at Madaba. I've been in there. It's quite a beautiful, remarkable thing. Because when you go into Madaba, you'll see a mosaic on the floor. And I've mentioned this to you before, but some of you probably haven't heard it. There's a mosaic. The little pieces, you know, they put together and they form pictures. And it is a mosaic of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And it's got right smack down through the center of it a huge street. The Romans called it the Cardo Maximus. And on either side, you have these huge Corinthian columns. They changed the name of it to Aaliyah Capitolina, crucified all the Jews they could find to try to do away with the Jewish people. But there's something else they have at Madaba. How many ever been to the Garden Tomb? Okay. That's, if you could ever go to Israel, I, God bless your soul, I hope you can go sometime if the Lord doesn't come back because... You will not be disappointed. I went to Brother Bevington five times. I'd go 550 times if I could. He, he was over there probably 50 times. Brother Bevington was a good man, and he knew that place. But anyway, you come back to Madaba. You look at the garden tomb. The garden tomb is missing something. How many ever looked at a picture of it? What's it missing? It's missing the stone. The stone's not there. And that was a huge stone. Now, if you've ever seen a photograph of the garden tomb, you'll see that there's a channel. There's a channel in front of it where a stone would roll, okay? But there's no stone. But the, there at Madaba, they say that they have this round stone and that it's supposed to be the very stone that covered the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I can't say one way or another it is. You know, a lot of things like that in the Holy Land. But it is intriguing, isn't it? That they would have that. Think about that. That adds a little more to the historical account, to the historicity of what you're talking about. Because you've got another element involved, and they've got that stone. Then you've got that street, that, uh, that uh, Madaba, that uh, mosaic at Madaba. It's a church. You've got that. These are, these are historical things that speak to the Bible, that touch on the Bible outside scripture but they're out there they're there and they're real so God one day said Mephibosheth I said yes Lord he said I'm inviting you to my table I said you're kidding I don't I'm unclean I'm dirty woe is me I'm not fit to sit down at your table he said don't you worry about that I'll take care of cleaning you up I'll get you a lot cleaner than soap and water how do you know that? Revelation 1.5. He hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for this little time we have together. Our Father, I get excited. I know you know that. You know how I am when I think about these things like that. It really moves and stirs my soul. Father, tonight I pray that you bless everyone that's heard it and those that are streaming in here tonight that heard it out there. Bless them. Bless your word as the Lord broke it and blessed it. It will not return void. And I know that tonight. I'm assured of that. I'm certain of that. Your word now will work what you want it to do. In thy name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, folks.